As many of you know, before I got ordained, I spent five months as an intern chaplain at Sibley Memorial Hospital. And I loved being a chaplain. I loved visiting patients. I loved just sort of being there where they were, you know, offering whatever I could to help them. And I was a pretty good chaplain. But as it turns out, I was a lousy colleague. Here's the problem. So this is how my day went. I was often coming to the hospital from work. And so I'd kind of arrived there in a rush. I would get there, I would pull on my chaplain smock, sit down at the computer and look for patients to visit. You know, I would look for patients who had just been admitted. I would look for patients who had been there for a while but hadn't had a visit. And so I'd take about 10 or 15 minutes to do this, come up with a list of patients, grab that list and whoosh, off I went. Now, I gotta say that, you know, during the first couple months, my efficiency really paid off. I saw a lot of patients, a lot more than my fellow interns. The problem was, in the process, I cut myself off from my fellow interns. Often when I got there, there'd be a chaplain from the last shift, you know, sitting in the chaplain's office, and I would, you know, nod, you know, wave, you know, and kind of say, hello, how you doing? Gotta go. And, or there'd be a couple chaplains sitting there chatting. And again, I'd be polite, but off I went. And then a couple months into the program, my colleagues called me on it, you know, as well they should. And I felt awful. I hadn't, I just hadn't realized what I was doing. And so I really did change my ways. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm proud of the work I did as a chaplain. But I'm sorry that I missed the opportunity to connect more with my colleagues. You know, just have the opportunity to, to chat together, to learn from one another. You know, just to take part in that kind of, kind of emotional give and take that we all need, that we all need to nourish us. So this month, our Soul Matters theme is generosity. And so what I want to talk about is attention as a form of generosity. The idea that one of the greatest gifts that we can give to one another is nothing more than our undivided attention. And that's a generous gift because it's so rare, isn't it? Sure, we might have some family or some friends that we love to talk with who, who make us feel seen and loved and accepted, but if you're like me, it's easy to go through a lot of social interactions on autopilot. And I really am talking about myself here. You know, when I go to the grocery store, I'm, I'm in the checkout at the gas station. You know, I'm always pleasant and I'm always easygoing, but I'm not always engaged. And sometimes when I'm on Zoom calls at work, you know, I'm paying attention. You know, I am paying attention, but I'm sort of there. And I even zone out at home. You know, Kitty Fish, one of our cats, she, she's a lap cat, and she loves to jump up on our laps in the evening and get pets. And if I'm looking at my phone when she's on my lap and I'm petting her, she will actually reach up and <laughs> swat at the phone. It's like, pay attention to the kitty. <laughs> and really, over the last year, I've realized how much I'm missing out on life. I actually, what brought this to my attention was just about a year ago, uh, Karen's mother died. And I did the service. I, I wrote, you know, and when I was doing her, writing her eulogy, I was doing all this research. You know, she, her family lived in a small town, and so she got written up in the paper. And she was a rather accomplished person, and so there's a lot to work with. And as I'm sitting there rewriting her eulogy, I realized how much I didn't know about her. And I've known her for 35 years, you know, something more than that. And as I just, I talked, but how often did I really pay attention? How often did I really ask questions? But really what I'm talking about here isn't necessarily having deep conversations like I wish I'd had with my mother-in-law. I'm talking about even the small things 
Think about that reading that Joan just shared. You know, the writer's describing the simplest of interactions, going to a, a you know, bank drive through You know, we've all done that without thinking. But in this case, the teller turned it into something more, of, into a moment of connection. You know, they didn't have a meaningful exchange beyond, you know, just what was necessary for the transaction. But the teller made it count. You know, she, she leaned over, maybe she stood on her tiptoes so that they can make eye contact when she was just sending him on his way. And the effect was magical. Again, he writes, it wasn't the words that stayed with me, but what she said with that gesture of leaning so I could see her over the hood of the truck, what she said with the effort she made to ensure that our eyes met when she wished me a joyful day. I mean it, her attention seemed to say, and I want you to know it. She went the extra mile or perhaps an extra few inches to acknowledge me as a human, to make me feel as if my presence was important to her. There's the magic. There's the generosity. She made him feel that her, his presence was important to her. David Brooks, a columnist for the New York Times, recently published a book called How to Know a Person. Highly recommend it. In this book, he talks about how to connect with others in a meaningful way, how to connect with loved ones, with friends, with coworkers, and so on. And he said he wrote this book because he realized how important that experience of connection is. He says there is one skill that lies at the heart of any healthy person, family, school, community, organization, or society. The ability to see someone else deeply and make them feel seen. To accurately know another person, to let them feel valued, heard, and understood. That is at the heart of being a good person, the ultimate gift you can give to others and to yourself. Human beings need recognition as much as they need food and water. And I don't think Brooks is exaggerating. If you've ever worked in a job or lived in a place where you feel invisible, where you feel unaccepted or unappreciated, you know the toll it takes on you. Feeling seen and accepted feeds our way in a way that nothing else does. Now, let me, I wanna uh, be careful here. When I use language like see, I'm not talking about visual experience. You could be visually impaired. You can, have, you can be uncomfortable making eye contact, like I sometimes am. But you can still give people the gift of your intention. So why are some of us so stingy with our attention? I think part of the problem is that it's so easy to be task-oriented, right? You know, I think about my time at Sibley. As I saw it, my job was to see as many patients as possible to provide the best care I could to people in need. Yeah, that was my job. Literally, that was my job. It was important both to me and my patients. The problem was, I didn't see that the other part of my job was to be present for my colleagues. And this is considered an important part of the internship experience, and for a good reason. Because to do a good job with patients, we needed to be nourished by our colleagues. You know, the work with patients was emotionally taxing. It was physically taxing. We needed each other's support. We needed that nourishment that just came with that give and take. And I finally realized that. And when I realized that and began to take part in that with my colleagues, I became a better chaplain. I became a better chaplain. Now again, there's nothing wrong with being task-oriented. There's good reason for being so. But what if we gave ourselves a new task? What if we saw it as part of our job to help people feel loved, and seen and accepted. What if we saw this as part of our jobs as you use, as part of our calling? Think about it. What's our, what's our first principle? Come on, someone shout it out. Our first principle currently. So, Paul, what's our first principle? <laughs> someone shout it out. 
dignity. We affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and we love our principal right. Sorry, Paul, didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> you know, but we love this principle, right? For many of us, this is the heart of our faith. So what if we treated this not as a principle, but as a task? as a job to be done, a task to remind people about their inherent worth and dignity, to, to make them feel loved and seen and accepted. What if we accomplish this task by giving people our full attention? And again, I'm not talking about something deep. I'm talking about just the most casual interactions. A smile. I'm talking about a smile. Years ago, I was at a GA and I was at a, a training on um, right, racial justice. And one of the speakers was an African American man who said, Hey, if you pass a black man on the street, smile at him because it may be the only smile he sees all day. Right? And that really made an impression on me. And so, Think about that smile. A smile is a way of letting someone know that they are seen, that they are recognized, that they are, they are worthy of attention. How hard is it to hand someone a credit card and smile? How hard is it to open the door for someone and smile? I recently read a book-long poem by Ross Gay called Behold. It's a fascinating book. On the surface, it's about Julius Irving, the basketball player, and this wonderful shot he did when he was in the prime of his career. And Ross Gay talked about watching it over and over and over and just beholding this, 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 beautiful, this beautiful moment. But really, it's a book about how we, see, how we save each other by seeing each other. In this poem, he plays with different meanings of the word behold. So the first is literal. Behold, we, we take notice of someone, right? Behold, yeah, we notice them. The second meaning speaks to a deeper engagement. We hold another with our attention to behold, we hold another with our attention. So think about that, re uh, sorry, whoops. Um, so then the third meeting is interesting. Behold, to be holden to each other, to feel a sense of obligation. So Ross Gay's point is that we are beholden to each other. We are beholden to hold each other with our loving attention, to make each other feel loved and seen and accepted. Again, think about that teller, that exchange with the teller. So Ross Gay writes, how do we be holding each other? And that's two words there, be and holding. So again, how do we be holding each other? How do we be beholden to each other? which is really to say, how do we be? How, to, how do we be? I believe that this is part of our calling as Unitarian Universalists, to make people feel beheld. This is our job wherever we are, wherever we go. This is our job as partners and parents and children. This is our job as coworkers and customers. This is our job whenever we encounter other people. Our task is to pay attention. However brief or routine the encounter, our task is to make the other person feel as if we're saying, lo and behold, look at you. You are loved. Lo and behold, I love that phrase. So lo and behold, do you know what lo means? It's just short for look. So it means look and behold, which seems like it's redundant except for it's not. The first is notice. The second means pay attention. The phrase lo and behold means give it your full attention. Lo and behold. This is our calling 
So I want to make you really uncomfortable. We're going to actually give this a try. <laughs> I want you to take a moment, look around, look around at everyone in the sanctuary. All right? Look back at the camera. There's a number of people online. You know, acknowledge the people who are part of this gathered community. Okay? Look. Behold. Behold. All right. Now, on the count of three, I want you to say, lo and behold. All right? <laughs> on the count of three, one, two, three. Lo and behold. And back to the camera. One, two, three. Lo and behold. People, lo and behold. You are loved. You are loved. It is so. Amen. <laughs>